Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for bravely getting out of bed and coming here today. I know it was a long night for many and an early morning for most, um, myself included. So thank you. And special thanks to SAR uh, for allowing me to be here with you. Um, it is such an incredible opportunity to be among such a vibrant community of scholars and to work in such a beautiful place. Um, again, my name is Allie Heller, and today I'm going to talk to you about women's reproductive health in the Global South, and particularly in Francophone West Africa in the country of Niger. So, as anthropologists, we tend to think a lot about inequity and power about the winners and the losers of global exchanges and local connections, something I think we'll be thinking a lot more about in the next four years. Maternal health is a particularly fruitful area for thinking about power and inequity. Global disparities between um, maternal mortality rates, and that is deaths due to uh, pregnancy or childbirth, um, in resource-rich countries versus resource-poor countries is um, astonishing. It is actually larger than for any other vital indicator, estimated to be more than 100-fold. So let's look at the lifetime risk due to maternal death. And that is the probability that a 15-year-old female will eventually die from a maternal-related cause. So generally speaking, in sub-Saharan Africa, the lifetime risk of a 15-year-old girl is 1 in 36. Now, if we move to Niger, and that's the West African country where I've spent the last several years working, that goes up to 1 in 23. So let's assume that uh, we are all 15-year-old Nigerian women in this room. One of us, approximately, might die in our lifetimes of maternal-related causes. Now, if we're to travel up north all the way through the Sahara in Niger, go up through Libya, swim across the Mediterranean Sea, and make it to Greece, a path that many, many um, West Africans make every day, and we reach Greece, what do you expect the lifetime risk of maternal death might be? knowing that there's about a hundredfold difference between the Global North and the Global South. Any ideas? Take a guess. One in 100. One in 100? Okay. Yeah, pretty good. Maybe even one in 360, if we're to look at that, if we're to think about, you know, the hundredfold difference. It is actually much worse. There is more than a 1,000 time less risk between Niger and Greece. There is a 1 in 23,700 chance of maternal death in Greece versus Niger. But for every woman that dies of an obstetric-related complication in Niger, 5 to 13 more survive with obstetric-related disabilities, or morbidities, as we call them. And I've spent the last several years looking at one in particular, obstetric fistula. Now, we'll get to the particularities of what causes fistula in a minute, but it's important to know that obstetric fistula is called, caused by prolonged obstructed labor and results in chronic incontinence. Now, you might not have heard of obstetric fistula before, and that would be reasonable, considering that it is almost non-existent in the Global North. In fact, the last fistula hospital in the United States closed its doors in 1895. But it is pretty common in the Global South, and particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, and affects an estimated one to two million women in the Global South, but particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, and quite a few of those women are located in Niger. So, it's nearly non-existent in the Global North, quite prevalent in the Global South, and thus comes to be seen as this archaic disorder of traditional Africa. 
Which brings us to one of the main themes that we're going to talk about today, which is that of representation. One of the three themes that we're going to talk about today is how humanitarian organizations represent distant suffering of brown-bodied women, particularly in Africa, but in the global south generally. Now, I talk about how this suffering is emblematic of long-standing patterns of engagement of the global north in the global south. And I critique the way in which distant and gendered suffering is viewed, consumed, and commodified, and ultimately medicalized. Now, the second theme we'll be talking about is the clinical encounter between the disempowered, disempowered and the biomedical establishment. Now, fistula can be fixed through surgery. However, surgical intervention has been positioned as this panacea, a silver bullet. But I found that surgery is actually much less effective as it's been portrayed. And it is, in fact, this process of treatment seeking that, in many cases, increases social marginalization and produces social stigma for women seeking surgeries. The final theme we'll talk about as anthropologists, we like to talk about lived experience. So, we're going to look at how the sickness of urine, which is how fistula is referred to locally, affects women, right? How do women, their husbands, their co-wives, their kin, their communities, think about, conceptualize, and talk about, and ultimately treat fistula? As much as this project is about global connections and international international exchanges, it is ultimately a project of the intimate, right? It is, in fact, about vaginas, right? This is a project about intimacy, about kinship, about emotion. So, let's all get on the same page. Although fistula is a lens, right, medical anthropologists study particular conditions in order to illuminate larger social processes but we do have to actually understand what we're talking about when we talk about these conditions. So what is fistula? Well, it is a birthing injury that is caused by prolonged obstructed labor, most importantly, in the absence of access to high-quality biomedical intervention. Most importantly, cesarean section, or forceps delivery, vacuum aspiration. There are lots of different interventions that somebody could have. But about 15% universally, worldwide, of births will have a complication. Many of those are obstructed labor. But in lots of cases, such as the Global North, right here in Santa Fe, if there's an obstructed labor, such as me, with women who are less than 150 centimeters, are at risk of having obstructed labor. In that case, People in the Global North often get cesarean section or other kind of interventions. But if you live in Niger, and there's very little access to high-quality biomedical intervention, then you are in labor for days, sometimes up to a week. And what happens is the prolonged pressure of the fetal head pushes against the soft tissues of the pelvic wall and causes a pressure necrosis, right? So Blood cannot flow, and eventually that tissue dies. And after a few days, that tissue sloughs off and creates a hole, or what's known as a fistula, allowing either urine from the bladder or feces from the rectum to flow through the vagina, creating perpetual incontinence of urine and or feces. So, Fifteen years ago, there was very little recognition of the condition of fistula. Very few people in the Global North knew about it, and in fact, very few people in the Global South, where it was a condition that occurred quite frequently, knew about it either. But recently, there has been increased attention. And with increased attention comes a kind of coalescing of a singular narrative. So what has that narrative been? Well, it is pretty well represented in this 2013 op-ed column in the New York Times written by Nicholas Kristof called Where Young Women Find Healing and Hope. So let's read, a, read an excerpt. 
Danja Niger. They straddle in by foot, donkey cart or bus, humiliated women and girls with their heads downcast, feeling ashamed and cursed, trailing stink and urine. The first patient we meet is Hadiza Sule. With an impish smile, she still seems a child. Her family married her off at about 11 or 12. She was not consulted, but became the second wife of her own uncle. A year later, she was pregnant. She suffered three days of obstructed labor. By the time Hadiza was taken to a hospital for a cesarean delivery, the baby was dead, and she had suffered internal injuries, including a hole, or a fistula, between her bladder and vagina. Hadiza found herself shunned. Her husband ejected her from the house, and other villagers regarded her as unclean so that no one would eat food that she prepared, or allow her to fetch water from the well when others were around. She endured several years of this ostracism, a few months ago, Hadiza heard about the Donja Fistula Center and showed up to see if someone could help. Dr. Steve Aerosmith, a urologist from Michigan, operated on Hadiza and repaired the damage. Women who have suffered for years find hope here. As they await surgery, their dormitories echo with giggles and girl talk. They are courageous and indomitable, and now full of hope as well. So in February of 2013, I met Hadiza during my year of fieldwork at the Donja Fistula Center, about six months before Nicholas Kristof arrived. I knew Hadiza, but this is not how I would have told her story. But Kristof's tale was very similar to many stories of fistula in which girls are victimized by African men, abused, neglected, and eventually dismissed and discarded. Tales in which brown-skinned girls must be saved, and Westerners, their goodwill, their dollars, their surgeons, and their scalpels, save them. Tales in which, through humanitarian intervention and technological solution, these girls find salvation. Physical, social, emotional, and sometimes religious. Over long chats and leisurely meals and in-depth interviews, I heard a multifaceted story about Hadiza's negotiation of constraints and her incredible resilience. Now, Hadiza was not married to her uncle. Hadiza was not ejected from her household when she developed fistula, and biomedicine did not save Hadiza. When I first met her, she had already undergone six unsuccessful surgeries. The last time I spoke with Hadiza, that number climbed to eight. It is very unlikely that Hadiza will ever go home dry. Although the names of the particular women and the sub-Saharan African countries which serve as their backdrop change, the general contours of this fistula narrative do not. Like Christoph's narrative, most popular and academic treatments of fistula follow a well-rehearsed formula, an array of conspiring elements. First, we have archetypical sufferers, typically referred to as girls rather than women. They are victims of child and forced marriages. After the onset of their fistulas, they are stigmatized, abandoned, mistreated by kin and communities, typically divorced, physically isolated, and eventually driven to depression and sometimes even suicide. And it is through biomedicine, and typically Westerners' hands, money, and their goodwill, that they find physical, social, emotional, and often religious redemption. Now, this narrative is so ubiquitous, it is difficult to find any articles that do not follow its general contours. Here, if we go back to New York, the New York Times op-ed column, we can see that each, part plays, each um, part plays a special kind of part, I guess. We have archetypical sufferers suffering in archetypical ways and finally finding biomedical redemption. It is very difficult to read any article in media or donor literature, and even often academic literature that does not follow the general contours. So let's go back to Niger. For those of you who weren't totally sure where Niger is located, here is a convenient map. It is north of Nigeria, south of Algeria and Libya, and just to the east of Mali and west of Chad. <laughs> 
Now, Niger is ranked 188 out of 188 on the United Nations development, Human Development Index, and it has a total fertility rate of 7.6 birds per woman. Now, that situates Niger as both the poorest country in the world and with the total highest fertility rate in the world. Now, this confluence of extreme pronatalism and poverty situates Niger as an ideal place to look at obstetric fistula. So I spent about 18 months, a year and two summers, at four fistula centers, three in the capital of Niamey, and one about 500 miles east of the capital at a rural center in Donja, just 20 miles north of Nigeria. Now, I used a mixed methods approach to data collection, using um, collecting quantitative data through standardized surveys and qualitative data through standard ethnographic methodologies such as participant observation, focus groups, and of course, in-depth interviews, the most important of which were with 100 women with fistula, about evenly divided from the four centers, um, following women home who had fistula. Now, that was a smaller group than I expected for um, largely ethical reasons, which will become apparent later, but also some safety reasons, um, mostly the spread of al-Qaeda of the Islamic Maghreb and Boko Haram from the southern borders. Um, also trying to get a larger time slice of how fistula affects women over a lifetime. So recruiting women who had been previously healed of fistula, and then talking to family members and husbands of women with fistula, and finally recruiting some professionals. So nurses, surgeons, uh, people working in humanitarian organizations, and other people who are active in fistula work. So let's paint with some broad, broad strokes. What were some of the findings? The first was demographic diversity. Although we have this narrative of the archetypical sufferer, I, in fact, found that women were so diverse. Although women did converge in some important ways, for example, women were mostly coming from very rural areas, women had very limited educational attainments, about 88% had never gone to any kind of formal education, um, and also religion. All women were Muslim, but Niger is a 98% Muslim country, so that's not surprising. Women had incredible diversity of age, um, geography, length of time living with fistula, parity, or number of pregnancies. Women had developed fistula from their first to their 12th labors throughout their reproductive lifespan. Uh, women had lived with fistula between one month and 50 years. Women came from across Niger, and represented all seven ethnic groups. They also came from neighboring countries, including Mali and Nigeria. I also found that, in contrast to this narrative of archetypical suffering and isolation, divorce, and abandonment, women actually remained entangled in these complex networks of support, caretaking, and obligation. Many women man managed to uh, keep their social ties intact. Many women managed to remain entangled in their household and support networks, particularly with their husbands, all while impressively concealing their fistulas, most impressively, sometimes from their husbands, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, and many women, were able to continue to have active sexual lives, sometimes managing to uh, have more children. Although, um, some quite surprisingly, uh, the number of stillborns was incredibly high. So, for example, although the child mortality rate among women with fistula was only 13%, which is quite high from our perspective, compared to the national rate in Niger, that's lower. Um, it's 16% in Niger as a whole. But when stillborns are added, which those of you familiar with demographics know that stillborns typically aren't included in child mortality rates, that number goes up to 76%. So uh, there's something to think about, particularly in a place, as we know, that is as pronatalist as Niger is. So thinking about identity formation. Um, 
is really important. And finally, I found uh, this overwhelming um, concern with biomedical failure. So, although surgical intervention is thought about as a discrete process, right, a discrete event, I found that it was actually this process that took sometimes months, but often years, and sometimes decades, that not only would take place in a single, a single event or a single space, but often traversed many centers, boundaries, sometimes ethnic, regional, or state boundaries. So women were often going to half a dozen or a dozen clinics, and sometimes all throughout West Africa, searching for treatment. So let's talk a little bit more about that. In the humanitarian and media narrative, um, surgical success is situated most frequently as 90%. So these come from four uh, prominent um, websites from fistula, uh, fistula organizations, and all of them say that success for fistula operations is 90%. This is not what I found. This is from the sample of the 100 women that I followed. I found that of the 71 women with fistula who underwent surgeries during the research period, only 36% attained continence. So that's pretty different than 90%. What's going on? It's also important to note this. Only 71 women actually underwent surgeries during the, repair, or during the um, research period. 29% did not. 29% were either still waiting or were denied surgeries because they had too complex fistulas, meaning that they were rendered, apparent, they were rendered uh, essentially statistically invisible. So this brings us to this point of the wide-scale inflation and distortion of surgical success rates. So, there is only a limited pot of money that all of these fistula centers are competing for. And as a result, all of these centers are trying to produce better data. So what I was seeing was this, um, this uh, pressure to manipulate data in order to produce a social fact that could be consumed and fit into the narrative. And the, the, way in which, um, the way in which administrators, staff, and centers would do this was actually quite uh, creative. And we can talk about that a little bit more, but what's important is that rather than reflecting actual surgical outcomes, this 90% fact was more of a um, social creation, which is important when thinking about statistics in general and not something we think about, right? We like to think about statistics as being hard facts and empirical, but rather, what we count and how we count it uh, is this process of, it's a decision-making process, right? So how these centers were deciding who to count, right? Do you count um, if three women, for example, if there was a woman and she had three surgeries during the year, and you're deciding how to calculate a success rate, do you count her as one woman, or do you count three surgeries? Well, what gives you a better success rate? So, what I found was that of the women in my sample, they had undergone a total of 278 surgeries in their lifetimes, not just during the 18 months. But 44% underwent between 3 and 11 previous surgeries. Now, what's important here is not just the emotional and physical cost, but also the cost of time. These surgeries weren't happening one after another. They were often happening between six months, one year apart. So think about that. If that is a year in between each surgery, and someone has 11 surgeries, that is 11 years away from one's family. That is 11 years away from one's husband. That is 11 years at a center 
where you are not working, you are not being productive, you are not making money, you are not birthing children. So thinking about the social cost of treatment seeking is quite important. What's also important is that it is widely acknowledged that the chances of surgical success is highest at the first operation. But as scar tissue accumulates and as the delicate tissues harden, surgical success, the chances of surgical success reduces with each intervention. So as a result, women were finding that time would march on and the prospect of restored continence would decrease with each surgery, but also the social cost of pursuing treatment would increase as women were away from their families longer and longer. So I argue that this process of treatment seeking and not actually the condition for which women were, treating, were seeking treatment, or fistula, was in many cases the causes of social stigma, marital rifts, and declining health. So why? Why was this happening? Well, first, the average wait time at the point of initial contact. So when I first interviewed women, when I first met them, the average amount of time they had already been at a center was five months. But that ranged from two weeks to six years. So what happened there? Infrequent surgeries, long waits, protracted absences from home had profound effects on women's lives. Right? It resulted in the deterioration of bonds back home, often marital friction, sometimes divorce. Right? The strength of women's connections began to, began to attenuate as women were seeking treatment, and they were away from home for these long periods of time. It's important to remember that 80% of the population in Niger lives in rural areas, often which are not connected to electricity and have no cell phone reception. So when women leave their homes to seek treatment, they often are no longer in contact with their entire social networks, and particularly their spouses. In Niger, polygyny is common. Husbands might take another wife. One might feel replaced. It's also important to remember that Niger is the poorest country in the world. Resources are scarce. If your husband takes another wife, the resources that might have been allocated to you and your children, if you have them, might then be reallocated to your co-wife and her children. So, the risk of these deteriorating social ties, specifically with husbands, and particularly when co-wives remain at home, vying for a position and resources was often enough to discourage women from continuing to seek care. Women were constantly weighing the hope for physical health against the risk of social harm. So although women are said to be divorced, right, thinking back to this Kristoff narrative, women get fistula, they get divorced. That wasn't the case. Only 23% of the women in my sample were actually divorced. The largest percentage remained married. But the second largest were in this really liminal state of marital separation. They weren't divorced, but these ties in their marriage were quite tenuous. And what that means is that for women, there was a whole lot at stake. Being gone for a very long time while, treating, while seeking treatment could have very profound implications on their home life, and thus their ability to have children and become a full-fledged woman. So becoming a full-fledged woman, that's an important concept, particularly in Niger that is so pronatalist, and brings us into this next concept of social stigma. Fistula is thought to be very stigmatized. In fact, I believe Nicholas Kristof, our friend in this talk, um, has called, I think he's written now, four columns um, likening uh, fistula to leprosy calling it, I think just two months ago, uh, the world's modern-day leper, women with fistula. So this evokes this idea of incredible stigma. 
Now, Arthur Kleinman, um, a prominent medical anthropologist, when he talks about stigma, he says, well, how do you know something will be stigmatized? He says, well, conditions that are stigmatized are ones that threaten what is most at stake, what we care about most. Well, in Niger, particularly for women, we might say that that is a condition that threatens fertility. Well, threaten Fistula certainly does that, right? It's very, as we heard about stillborns, right? There are many women who had, in my sample, who had 12 pregnancies and 12 stillborns. There are lots of women who could not birth life children. Uh, it is definitely a condition um, that implicates a lot of infertility issues. So fistula threatens what is most at stake, which is a full transition into adulthood. In Niger, particularly among the Hausa, you can be a 50-year-old woman, but if you have not birthed a living ch child, you are still called a budurwa, which is a, um, a girl with breast buds, technically. So, so not a woman. So we would expect a lot of stigma attached to fistula, going by this kind of Kleinman concept. And yet, I found that there really wasn't. Not all women experienced fistula. So what's going on? We need a different concept of stigma. We need something else. We need to rethink it. While well, using Parker and Agleton's idea of stigma coming from HIV-AIDS, maybe we can relook at it. It takes power to stigmatize, and it takes the lack of power to be stigmatized. So I found, after some research, that fistula only exacerbates pre-existing social vulnerabilities. So how did we get here? I will show you. It's very hard to measure stigma, particularly in a place where there is no word for stigma. Stigma is a, it's hard to measure concepts that kind of exist out in the ether. Right? There's no word for stigma in Hausa. So you have to do some triangulation. So to measure stigma, I triangulated between uh, participant observation, um, in-depth interviews, but I also used a standardized survey that had been used before and created um, in Hausa-speaking Nigeria to talk about HIV-AIDS. And I, of course, changed it to make it fit the context and the condition. Now, stigma can be cut into internal stigma, which are felt emotions such as shame, embarrassment, fear of judgment, and then external stigma, which is really more what we think about when we think about stigma, which is avoidance behaviors and mistreatment. So using an 18-question standardized survey for the 100 women, I, measuring first internal stigma, which again is through these proxy measurements of shame and embarrassment and fear of judgment, and then I aggregated the data into categories of none, low, some, high, and very high, I found that two-thirds of women experienced very high or high levels of internal stigma. So fistula was really affecting women psychologically. It was taking quite a toll. And only 15% of women reported none or low internal stigma. But when we look at external stigma, we find a different story, almost the inverse. So external stigma, or perceived external stigma, um, and this is measured through past mistreatment, avoidance behaviors, change in social networks. We find that three-quarters of women, or more than three-quarters of women, reported none or low, whereas only 7% of women reported high external stigma. Now, this is really interesting because this really is what is most associated with fistula, particularly from a Western point of view. This is where we hear of the abandonment, the isolation, the divorce, right? People not eating the food that is made from women with fistula, right? This is the avoidance behaviors. So we can learn a lot from these seven women. It's not that this doesn't exist, it's that it's rare. But if we can figure out who these seven women are and what unites them, perhaps we can learn something about stigma, not just about fistula. So I did some work to connect these seven women, to figure out what unites them. 
and through some um, actual statistics, which is kind of rare in anthropology, and uh, also looking at the in-depth interviews, I found out that what's unite what unites them actually is who they were before they developed fistula. They were exceptionally poor, which considering, as we know, that Niger is quite a poor country, and that women with fistula are even poorer than Nigerians in general, it was pretty remarkable that this cohort of women was even poorer. They were in unstable marriages, and they had strained relationships with their co-wives. So generally, we can say that these women were socially vulnerable before they developed fistula. But there was one predictor of external fistula stigma that was stronger than any other. In fact, the p-value was, was pretty remarkable. And that was the absence of a mother. So in Niger, a mother's protection and her love and support insulate women from destructive social dynamics, both pre- and post-fistula. So of the seven women who had the highest rates of external stigma, four had no mothers. And that was either because of high rates of maternal mortality, so they had lost their mothers during childbirth, or because of divorce. Um, women during divorce do not have custody of their children in Niger because uh, most of the ethnic groups are patrilineal, or because of abandonment, which was less, I think only one woman had that. Of the remaining 93 women, only 15% grew up without mothers. So it was pretty remarkable, the difference. Motherless girls and women were also married significantly earlier than their peers. That was 16 months earlier. Uh, they were vulnerable to intra-household politics, and they suffered more withholding of medical care, which meant, all of this meant that actually motherless girls were more at risk for developing fistula in the first place. And then once they developed fistula, they were less protected uh, from the social dynamics that might expose them to fistula stigma. So what we can say is that women with fistula who have mothers experience shame but little to no mistreatment. But motherless, single, poor, what all women who experienced high levels of external stigma shared was that they were socially vulnerable before their fistulas developed. So fistula exacerbates already existing vulnerabilities rather than being the sole cause of them. So when we think about any illness, right, not just in Niger and not just fistula, this is an important thing to remember. This is something that we can transfer here to the United States when thinking about how stigma works and particularly stigma related to illness. Something else I want to discuss is concealment. Now, fistula is thought about as being a highly visible condition, right? One that one, one couldn't possibly conceal. And yet, I found that women were spending incredible amounts of time transforming this visible condition into something invisible. In fact, 74% of women had made some effort to conceal their fistulas. And 55% of women had concealed their fistulas from all but their, social, but their closest social contacts. But most incredibly, 15% of women had concealed their fistulas even from their husbands. Several of them had concealed their fistulas from their husbands from year, for years or even decades, while continuing to be sexually active with these husbands. So how did they do it? Well, most women had dual strategies of concealment. They had this dual-pronged approach. The first was through these quotidian changes in behavior, in dress, and in hygiene. 
Now, this was a full-time job. Women were getting up in the middle of the night in order to change their pads, wash their pads, iron them, hide them, fold them, put perfume on them, and go to bed before anyone woke up. Right? Women were using pads, they were bathing several times a day. Women were fasting so that they would not leak during important events, or so that they would not leak when they had rotations with their husbands. Now, this is where polygyny served women very well. Right? Usually, in Niger, you have a two-day rotation with your husband. So, if you have a few co-wives, you've got two days on, and then maybe four days off, maybe six days off, and then two days on. So this allowed women some time to recuperate and not, and not acquire bladder stones. I found that women who had fewer co-wives were more likely to have bladder stones from fasting, particularly from dehydration. But women who had more co-wives were less likely to have those bladder stones because they, had, they were hydrated more of the time. And finally, women were spending almost all of their extra money on perfume. But then there was this less tangible way of concealing, and that was through this relational change. So modifying the modes of engagement with families, friends, husbands, households, and communities. So this was often through modes of secrecy. Right? Self-isolation, controlling information, opting out of social commitments and reciprocal relationships, social distancing, accepting marital separations in order to be further away from co-wives, because although co-wives did help them in some ways, as we heard with the longer rotations, they also were the ones that were most likely to jeopardize them, most likely to out them, um, most likely to be in their business, because co-wives are the ones that are at home with you while husbands are out all day. So they're going to see you, uh, they're most likely the ones that are going to see you change your pads, know where you're getting the fabric, see you spend the money. And relocation to rural from rural villages to urban areas where you can have more anonymity. So, Women were concealing, using self-isolation in order to pass as normal. But there was a cost, as there always is. In order to escape what Talcott Parsons in the 50s called the sick role, women were suffering these consequences of perceived social deviance. Women were breaking the community's social contract of these reciprocal relationships by not going to community events, by not engaging in the perceived accepted behaviors of maybe exchange, um, women were seen as being deviant. So as 27-year-old Isa told me, um, because she didn't go out, she was afraid of her pad becoming saturated and thus um, being outed by community members. She said, with this sickness, I don't go out much. If I do go to a friend's house, I won't stay long. I'll just greet her. My friends, they say that Isa, she doesn't like to go visit anymore. They gossip about me because of it, but only I know why. Because of it, my friends don't come very often to see me. If you stop visiting someone, that person will visit you less too. Good relationships depend on one's feet. So despite these immense sacrifices, social and financial and often relational, that women are making. It is often at centers that women are getting outed. So here you can see a woman at um, a fistula center who's being televised. So these NGOs will come. This one is the first First Ladies NGO, and they are giving uh, fabric and some lotion and some food and flip-flops, and in return, they want a little publicity. So they bring camera crews with them and ask women to come up and publicly give thanks, and that goes on television stations across Niger. So these women, who've maybe been concealing for years, are then outed as having fistula. Or another way that 
women are outed is through the donation specifically of fabric, which is often emblazoned with the word fistula. So this one says International Obstetric Fistula Day 2014. Now women are not in a position to refuse fabric as the acidity of their urine often eats through their skirt wrappers. Fabric is quite expensive and they are in need of fabric not just for outfits but also for the pads that they are perpetually using. Also, as no woman in my sample was literate, women may not know that they are advertising themselves as women with fistula when they go back home with carefully constructed alibis only to be a walking billboard for their condition. So in conclusion, the fistula narrative misplaces blame from, systematic, from systemic problems of access and geopolitical priorities and instead reinforces these assumptions about African, cultural uh, about African cultural inferiority, which gives rise to quick fix solutions for behavioral change. So these narratives not only have these conceptual consequences, but also quite concrete consequences, if we've, as we've talked about, which is evident in the long wait times at centers, singular focus on surgery, rather than the management of um, chronic fistula, reinsertion programs that don't meet women's needs and actually disregard women's need for confidentiality. But fortunately, uh, work can be translated into um, more ethnographically informed interventions, uh, which can predict on, a, on um, a set of social circumstances which women need more intensive interventions and which women should go home. So if we can predict based on this set of social circumstances which women are for high levels of external stigma, then those women can be prioritized for individualized interventions. So interventions can then be more individualized, um, arguably more, eff more efficacious. Um, so I have a short video, but I think in the... Um, I think for time, I'm not going to show it. So I think I'll just end there. Thank you. <laughs>